This is F10 of Integration Play. I wasn't going to do an F10, I was just going to go to G. But I'm interrupting it sort of to integrate. <laughs> A lot of the stuff that I've been saying all along from the very first episode of this series. Because I'm understanding now where history's going. I've kind of been saying it for a while, but I didn't have proof until Anoninominon kept bugging me about Matthew 24, 25 being a timeline. And he's right. He knows how to do the meter too. He has different opinions about how it ought to be done, which is good because, you know, how do you do the Bible meter when nobody even knows about it? And the scholars think they're looking for poetry meter. It's an accounting meter. And they're not counting the syllables. That's what counting is. Okay? But he understands it. So he's trying to do it a little differently. And we're arguing in the Frank Forum channel. Not arguing, but discussing. And he's coming up with a lot of really good ideas. We have very different approaches to the same passage in Matthew 24, 25. But it is definitely a timeline. And that gets me to my point about this audio. In front of you on your screen, slapped on for the whole audio, is Matthew 25, 11 in context. And you'll notice that at the halfway toward the end of it, or at the end of it, the last clause, it says, Lord, Lord, let us in, or something like that. I don't remember the English translation, because I'm looking at it in the Greek. That second Lord is the year 2016. Now, I've links to what I've just done are in the video description in, in the Matthew 24 series. Um, I'm approaching the whole topic from a very different perspective. But if the links in the video description turn out to be the right ones, because we don't know which meter's right, then that second Lord really is 2016 and... History takes a downturn, a downturn after that. Now what makes this particularly poignant is that I remember my own pastor, RB theme, you can get the classes on it yourself, uh, I remember him in 1997 saying that 1998 was going to be a really bad year, so if you're going to call the church to get the free classes, Look for uh, Series 376, 1992 Spiritual Dynamics. Get the New Year's Eve speech for the year 1998. In other words, December 31 or closest to it, 1997. They'll know what you're talking about. Because every single year, he would predict what the following year's historical trends would be like. 1998 ended up being a watershed year for the church, just like he said it would be. And he was running around the country in those days, you know, to Michigan and California and I forget where in the East Coast. And he would say pretty much the same thing. Because uh, believers in that church are all over the place, all right? And he said he didn't think. I saw him at the Michigan conference where he was making the same speech, but he was saying it before December 31. He was saying... I don't think there's going to be what he called a pivot for 1998 anymore. And he was worried that the United States was going to go down, stop being a client nation, as he would call it. You know, it's somebody with enough believers in it by 40 years from then. Well, 40 years from them would be 23, 20, 38. I think. Let me check it on the calculator. I'm really tired, so. 1998 plus 40. Yeah, 2038. It turns out that in the Matthew 25 meter, 2038 is where um, things start to go really bad in the meter. You can't see it in the English. 
Okay, so that's why you need those links in the video description. You can just follow along with your English Bible if you don't yet know the Greek. Just look at the numbers and then look at the verse in your favorite translation. Now, if that's true, and the thing that's so remarkable about him saying that, because he didn't know the meter, is that when he said 1998 was going to be bad, in the meter, that's at the verse where it says the bridegroom shut the door. Because the meter is 30 less than the A.D. year. Because Christ is speaking it in 30 A.D. So you add the one syllable per year from 30 A.D. forward. So the verse where it says, just above the Lord, Lord verse, where it says the bridegroom shut the door, that was 1998. So we're now talking about integrating our learning in Bible to history right now. Because from 2036 onward, going by the meter and the text, because the meter always elucidates the text, Things are going to go bad, and they're going to stay bad. They're still going to be growth, but right now, or you know, at that point forward, in order for growth to occur in Christians, things got to be bad. Now, usually bad means war. Okay? And you can look prior, when you look at the video description, you look at the links, and you look at just the numbers, because you can see what verse it is, and then look it up in English. And you see just the numbers, and you add 30 to each of those numbers to know what A.D. year it is. Look at the words, by syllable counts, that correspond to the wars we've had in the past. And the, the, the way the meter works is that when it's sevens, that's good. And when it doesn't, that's bad. When it doesn't, it means that Christians in mass are not growing. Okay? They're not growing. That instead, they're apostate. When you see a orange, because I don't have gold, when you see an orange number in the first column of the numbers... That means that there's growth. And then the notes at the end of the page explains what each of those numbers means doctrinally because it's all based on stuff in the Old Testament. So what you need to integrate is if this interpretation is true, and frankly you don't even need the meter to guess at it, we're in for a really nasty future within the next 15 years. Now, one of the reasons that it goes nasty, and actually the number one reason, is because Christians aren't interested in learning and living on Bible. They're into religion, or they're into something else, or they're only a nominal Christian. Nominal Christian means that you're not learning and living on Bible. If you're not using 1 John 1 9 and studying under your right teacher, if you're studying under the wrong teacher, or no teacher, or you're into some religious denomination thing where you sit down, stand up, sit down, you know, like Greek Odox or Calvinism or Catholicism, because Calvinism has its own little rules now. You know, you have to evidence your salvation. Really? And what do they call evidence? Doing good deeds. Well, then all Muslims should be in heaven because they do a lot of good deeds. The same thing is true for most other religions, too. The Mormons, you know, they call themselves Christian, but I'm not sure they qualify as Christian because they don't seem to understand what the gospel is. So then do they believe that Jesus Christ paid for their sins? They think he's from another planet and that he and Satan are brothers. And that they brought their fight down to this planet, which, of course, L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology sort of took that idea and ran with it to create an even more goofball sci-fi idea that a whole lot of Scientologists actually think is true. And he thinks that the Jews are what he calls body thetans. Like little hidden humans that are crawling on your skin. You don't learn that till you've paid like $100,000 into Scientology and you're at the OT7 or OT8 level. If you look at my Scientology playlist here on YouTube, you can hear him say that for yourself, if that video is still up. I, you know, I collected videos from all around YouTube. But you can Google on it. 
because this is something that's known. Just Google on body thetans and Jews and L. Ron Hubbard because he was anti-Semitic. Now, that gives you a, a sort of preview of coming attractions. Why things have to go bad, even without the meter. Christians are pro-life. You can't be more anti-biblical than that. Christ took all sexual sin out of the law in John 8. What, nobody can read it? He who is without sin casts the first stone. Yeah, because adultery was punishable by stoning under the Mosaic Law. Well, if he took it out of the Mosaic Law, then he took it out of law. And pro-life is really all about, well, some woman got pregnant. If she has an abortion, she must have been having fun with somebody she wasn't married to. It's really sick. They want to give to Caesar what belongs to God. And God says, hey, I created you at birth. Genesis 2, 7. Adam wasn't alive until God breathed the soul into Adam's nostrils, which means the body was already fully formed and out on the ground, which is exactly the sequence you'll see in Genesis 2-7. Now, pro-lifers are so dumb they can't even read that in translation because it's essentially right in translation. Breathing life is really lives, plural, in the Hebrew. Otherwise, it's exactly what the Hebrew says. If they can't read that, if they can't read Exodus 21, 22, even in the Catholic Bibles, New Jerusalem and uh, Douay Reims. The Douay Reims has been out since 1610. Catholic Bibles say that miscarriage, which is spontaneous abortion, is not murder. And it was spontaneous because some guy hit the woman and that's what caused her to miscarry. So that's like he caused her to abort. What's the difference between that and the doctor doing it? Okay? It's, a, it's to be, de the penalty for it is to be determined between the woman and her husband. So then it's the woman and her husband who determine whether or not she should get an abortion. Not anybody else and not the law. It was never in the Mosaic Law. In fact, God actually ordered an abortion in Numbers 527. And if you look at my pro-life blasphemy series, it's abbreviated PB. So just Google search or um, YouTube search on Brain Audi PB or pro-life blasphemy. And you'll get the whole playlist. Or you can just look it up in my playlist on my channel. That's episode 9 and 10. All those verses I just cited, I went through the Hebrew in detail in episode 9 and 10. Okay, so then what? All the pro-lifers who just started their little thing in the 1970s. Are, are they more holy than all the Christians prior, including the Catholic Church, who never, ever, ever in history made a civil law against abortion? There was never a civil law, and it was never criminalized. If you wanted an abortion or you had a question about it, you went to your teacher, your pastor, your rabbi, or something. Everybody had a spiritual position on it, but nobody ever made it a law. So what, all the Christians prior to the 1970s in America were totally wrong, and only the Christians from the 1970s America onward are right? You're beginning to understand why God's going to have to discipline the United States, like my pastor warned. Shutting the door in Matthew 25, when the bridegroom comes... That's the text that ends at 1998. Shutting the door. That means judgment time. And there's always grace before judgment. That's why the 40 years ending at 2038. The actual text in the actual meter of Matthew 25 blocks it at 2036. So maybe my pastor was off by two years. I mean, because the word door is not the last word in the verse. 
So maybe it's measuring the 40 years from where the word door is in the Greek text. But without that text, without all this, to many people, arcane stuff about counting the syllables, which you had to do anyway to memorize the text, they didn't, they didn't, they couldn't carry it conveniently. So they just memorized it. And then they would go look at it, you know, when they went to shul every Saturday. Now, that kind of background with these kind of goofball believers, and you know how many of them are backing Trump? All the evangelicals are backing either Trump or Cruz. Cruz belongs to a, to a so-called Christian sect called Seven Mountains. Look up Revelation 17. The harlot is sitting on seven mountains. The seven mountains in Revelation are seven polities. But the seven mountains sect can't read Revelation 17 to know it's a condemnation and doesn't know what mountains are, even though scholars have been explaining it for centuries. They think it's seven mountains of influence and they want to elect Ted Cruz to president or Donald Trump because the whole evangelical movement is split between those two. In order for them to have the influence in the mountain of politics, mountain of politics, mountain of media, mountain of education, mountain of business, and I forget what the other two stupid things are. And you can Google on this, and you, you can Google on the Seven Mountains movement and Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. You can also see videos in YouTube on the same thing. So you can write those search terms in YouTube or search on Rafael Cruz and hear him, who's he's Ted Cruz's dad, talk about it. They think they replace Israel. So how pro-Israel is Ted Cruz, really? And how pro-Israel is Donald Trump going to be if he got nominated and elected? Not very. Because the people backing him are anti-Semitic to the core. They think that Israel has no future in history, that we inherited all of Israel's promises. My pastor excoriated that whole idea for 50 years. And it started well over 50 years ago. It started under Constantine. And Paul warned about it in Ephesians. And obviously John warns about it in Revelation 17. Political church, Roman style. Yeah, because ancient Rome was all about uniting church and state. The Caesar of Rome was Pontifex Maximus. That means chief priest. Over all of the many religions that were honored in Rome. So it's like this constant trend, satanic obviously, of trying to resurrect the unity of church and state. And the evangelicals are backing those two. If God doesn't judge America, the whole, the whole world is in trouble. Now does that mean that we're going to stop being a client nation by 2036, 2038? I doubt it. And I can doubt it because you know what I'm going to do, assuming I live that long. I'm going to keep on growing in grace and the knowledge of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Second Peter 3.18. And you can do the same thing. Use 1 John 1.9, 1 learn and live on Bible, learn to your right mail only, teacher, and talk to God about it. And on occasion talk to other believers or listen to other believers too whenever you think God wants you to do that. Or whenever it helps you think. But make sure God wants you to do that so you don't waste your time or his. If only f 10 of us, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember what Abraham was saying to Jesus Christ in that theophany? When he was going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy it. He said, Lord, if there are 10 people. And he said, I won't destroy the city. Now, granted, this it was really five cities. And they weren't as big as the United States. So maybe there needs to be a hundred people in the United States who are growing, learning, and living on Bible like I just described. 
then he'll keep us from going under. But you know what I don't think is going to happen? I don't think we're going to avoid war. I think we're headed into war within the next 15 years. Because that's how God cleans house. A nation goes apostate. It loses interest in Bible. That's how you go apostate. So it's not learning and living on Bible anymore. And then it gets into politics and religion as a result. Because when you delete God as your interest, you get interest in something that's a substitute God. Like religion or politics. And then that means that the people are all fighting with each other over their brand of religion or politics. And of course, Europe suffered 400 years of that. Actually, a thousand if you count the, the time that the Catholic Church was, a, you know, putting the kibosh on everything and monopolizing your ability to even get a Bible. For a thousand years, better part of a thousand years, you had to be a monk or a nun or go work at a monastery, or know somebody at a monastery in order to even see a Bible. And that's all in the Matthew 24, 25 meter too. Its, uh, it's theme is the freeing of the Bible from 1140 A.D. to guess what? The English Reformation. The next most important period in history, and this is why I'm talking about this, is from 1140 A.D. until 2036 A.D. And the door being shut and the 40 years being up means the door on Bible is going to close somehow. Now, how can it close on Bible when we got the Internet and Bible software everywhere? Easy. Everybody gets interested in something else. Peer pressure. We're all interested in religion. We're all interested in politics. Never mind that the Bible is now commonly available to every every man, which the English Reformation set in motion, okay? If we're not looking at it, then it's as if it doesn't exist. So we're all going to lose, I might say all, it's, well, you know, 99% already. It, that's true. But that 99% gets so bad that God's going to have to clean house. And the best way to clean house is to have a war. Which is what the people are going to clamor for anyhow because they want to fight with each other, polarizing over their religion and their politics. That's happening, honey. All you have to do is turn on the TV. All you have to do is look at the stupid election and the speeches being made. The left, the Democrats, are moving much farther left. The right, the Republicans, excepting Donald Trump, who's a closet Democrat. The right is moving much farther right. So they can't meet in the middle. That's scary. Because if everybody thinks they can't meet in the middle, and they got to demonize the other side, then you have war. And if we're doing it in the U.S., other countries around the world, they say they hate us. Okay, fine. But they ape us. You can't look anywhere except in some Arab countries. You can't look anywhere else on the map, go anywhere else in the world, and not see what looks like substantially American dress, substantially American-style businesses, hotels, shopping centers... I mean, they even have they even have grocery stores in Saudi Arabia. One guy wanted to divorce his wife. He grabs a microphone in a grocery store in Saudi Arabia. Says, "I divorce you. I divorce you. I divorce you three times." And you can still find that in the um, FFI forum. Bread and milk, please, is the part of the title. Divorce, bread, and milk. Something like that. There's a grocery store? An American-style grocery store in Saudi Arabia, for crying out loud. Everybody apes our culture. They hate it, and they ape it at the same time. Why? Because we're rich, and we're the biggest guy on the block at the moment. Sooner or later, somebody's going to want to say, you know what? 
We're sick of the United States being the biggest guy in the block. We're big too. And Russia is rattling its sabers and China is rattling its sabers. So here's what you need to rattle. Learn and live on Bible under your right teacher using one John 1 9 is needed and talk to God about it. And try to integrate everything you do. Ask God to remind you. Okay, I'm writing an email, Dad. I don't know. What should I be thinking? You're in the toilet. What should I be thinking? You're looking at your refrigerator with the door open. What should I be thinking? You're in a, an exclusive car dealership. Probably not a car dealership because if you're going to buy this kind of car, you usually do it some other way. If you're in an exclusive car dealership trying to find your 16th Maserati or you're negotiating to buy an island because you're a billionaire. Okay. What should I be thinking, Dad, applies to all those issues, all those scenarios. It applies to any scenario, when you're awake and when you're asleep. That's in Deuteronomy. Doctrine is supposed to be in your head and on your head, and that's what the tefillin were for. Those little leather strips that you see Jews wrap around their head and on their arms. The idea of wrapping it around your head and on your arms is so that when, whatever you're thinking and whatever you're doing, Torah guides you. Okay, well, you got the full Bible now. They only had part of it. Is it guiding you? And how does it guide you when you write an email or take out the trash? Well, look, think toward God. Okay, Dad, what doctrine applies to what I'm doing? What, what am I learning here? And the more mature you become, the more you realize what you're learning here. It's, it's amazing how God can take a stupid thing. You're sitting on the toilet taking a dump. He can turn that doo-doo into diamonds. He's done it for me often. Really often. And the more mature you become, the more you understand what it is he's doing. But at least keep asking the question. That will help the U.S. stay alive. That will help you stay alive. That will integrate God into your life. And that's what saves the world. Not knocking on doors. Not going out there and doing great things for Jesus. Not so winning. Not doing good deeds. You got to do God deeds. Because only God can save us now. Because look how bad we Christians are. We're religified. We're politicizing Christianity. You can't get worse than that. We're going back to Egypt. And what did God do to Israel when she tried to go back to Egypt? He made her wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That's where we are now. So now this was, uh, you know, an audio on integrating your spiritual life in light of very near future history. Think about it. You got any comments or disagreements? Say so in the comments. Peace out.